I presented part of this topic at a patristics conference in Hungary <clears throat> where there were lots of Roman Catholics, Orthodox, and uh, Greek, Orthodox, uh, Greek Catholic uh, theologians. And uh, when, when I sat with them and, and talked about these issues, I felt that we Protestants have just as much uh, a right to sit at the table, but we don't often sit at the table. Uh, and uh, what I'm going to present is, is one little discovery uh, that I made when I was uh, trying to understand the nature of apostolic authority. And uh, what I would like to present to you is, um, and maybe some of you have already discovered this, so I'm not claiming that this is my, my discovery, but something that made me really excited. What I would like to pre uh, show you is that I believe that the sub-apostolic church, so the, the, the church uh, after the, the, the age of the apostles and even at, the, at, the, at the, the end of the age of the apostles, in some sense viewed the apostles as the elders of the church. Uh, so my, my thesis for now, now is that the apostles were the elders of the universal church in one sense. But uh, the Eusebian paradigm, which I will explain what it is, prevents us from seeing them in that role. But when we re-examine uh, Eusebius' interpretation of Papias, then other evidences come to the surface. And this gives us a closer access to the normative tradition of the apostles. So we can get closer to the apostles uh, historically than what is often thought to be the case. My outline is we will look at the Eusebian paradigm, which is basically that the elders that Papias refers to are the disciples of the apostles, not the apostles themselves. Then we will examine uh, that particular text that Eusebius interprets that creates this paradigm. Then we will look at other evidences where we see the apostles as elders of the church. And then I will draw some conclusions about the significance of this to our access to apostolic witness. So what is the Eusebian paradigm? Eusebius uh, of Caesarea lived in uh, the third century. And almost everything, not exactly everything, because we have Papias, uh, references to Papias in other works. But most of our knowledge of what Papias wrote come from Eusebius' church history. And I would like uh, us to go through that chunk of material in which Eusebius uh, quotes Papias. And, uh, and then we will see what, how he interprets Papias. And then we will re-examine his interpretation. So this is what uh, Eusebius writes in his church history. There are, uh, there are extant five books of Papias which bear the title, Expositions of Oracles of the Lord. Irenaeus makes mention of these as the only works written by him in the following words. So he's quoting now Irenaeus. These things are attested by Papias, an ancient man who was a hearer of John and a companion of Polycarp in his fourth book. For five books have been written by him, end of quote. These are the words of Irenaeus. But Papias himself, in the, preface of, in the preface to his discourses, by no means declares that he was himself a hearer and eyewitness of the holy apostles. But he shows by the words which he uses that he received the doctrines of the faith from those who were their friends. So Eusebius is uh, already giving his interpretation of Papias. No, it's not what Irenaeus says. Papias was not a hero of the eyewitnesses. Uh, sorry, he was not an eyewitness uh, or a, a hero of uh, the holy apostles, but their friends. He says, and now he's quoting Papias, but I shall not hesitate also to put down for you, along with my interpretations, whatsoever things I have at any time learned carefully from the elders and carefully remembered, guaranteeing their truth. 
For I did not, like the multitudes, take pleasure in those that speak much, but in those that teach the truth, not in those that relate strange commandments, but in those that deliver the commandments given by the Lord to faith and springing from the truth itself. If then any one king who had been a follower of, it, of the elders, I questioned him in regard to the words of the elders. What Andrew or what Peter said or what was said by Philip or by Thomas or by James or by John or by Matthew or by any other of the disciples of the Lord. And what things Aristion and the presbyter John, the disciples of the Lord, say. Now notice uh, here it says presbyter and not elder, but we will see that it's the same word. So it, it is already conveying the paradigm or using the paradigm, making a distinction, which does not exist in Papias, I believe. The disciples of the Lord say, for I did not think that what was to be gotten from the books would profit me as much as what came from the living and abiding voice. It is worthwhile observing. So uh, here's the end of Papias, and now Eusebius comes. It is worthwhile observing here that the name of John is twice enumerated by him. The first one he mentions in connection with Peter and James and Matthew and the rest of the apostles, clearly meaning the evangelist. But the other John he mentions after an interval and places him among others outside of the number of the apostles, putting Aristion before him and he distinctly calls him a presbyter. This shows that the statement of those is true who say that there were two persons in Asia that bore the same name and that there were two tombs in Ephesus, each of which, even to the present day, is called John's. It is important to notice this, for it is probable that it was the second, if one is not willing to admit that it was the first that saw the revelation, which is ascribed by name to John. And Papias, of whom we are now speaking, confesses that he received the words of the apostles from those that followed them, but he says that he was himself a hearer of Aristion and the presbyter John. At least he mentions them frequently by name and gives their traditions in his writings. These things, were, we hope, have not been uselessly adduced by us. So let me uh, try to show what, you, what is... Uh, the distance between Papias and the Lord Jesus, according to Eusebius, and uh, I, here I show you what I think it is, and then we will go and see which one is true. So, according to Eusebius, the apostles heard the words of Jesus, then, then comes the next generation, the elders, who were the friends or the disciples of the apostles, and then there were those who heard the elders and Papias inquired of these people who heard the elders who were the disciples of the apostles, including John. This is Eusebius', Eusebius paradigm. And when uh, you read the, the widespread reference to the presbyter John or the elder John, this this figure, this almost mythical figure in the uh, first, second century, um, then you see the, the paradigm of, at work. Now, I think this is, a, this is not a good interpretation of Papias. What I'm suggesting and what I will argue for is that I think in Papias' mind, he's not three, four steps away from Jesus, but only two, three steps away. I think the elders that he refers to are the apostles, including John. And Papias inquired of those who knew the apostles and personally knew John the apostle. So he was himself closer, one generation closer to the teachings of Jesus than according to the Eusebian paradigm. Now what strengthens Eusebius' case? 
the argument that he uses is a rumor about the two tombs in John, of John in Ephesus. That is his argument, beside the syntactical argument that he puts uh, Aristion, that he uses the name of John twice and puts Aristion uh, between the, elder, uh, the apostles, the name of uh, the apostles and, and uh, Presbyter John. Eusebius probably took this uh, from Dionysius of Alexandria, who used it as an argument against the millennialism of uh, Nepos, uh, uh, an Egyptian bishop. But Jerome, who relied on Eusebius, remarks that many thought the two tombs were of the same John, the evangelist. So, this is not proving anything. Uh, even Jerome says that it could be the, the two tombs of the same John. And we know examples of that, that uh, they didn't know where it was buried, and then here was a memorial, there was a memorial, and both were claimed to be tombs. But uh, there is another argument that we can make for uh, Eusebius's paradigm. Irenaeus also references the elders. He talks about the others, and this is what he says in Against Heresies. The predicted blessing, therefore, belongs unquestionably to the times of the kingdom, as the elders who saw John, the disciple of the Lord, related that they had heard from him how the Lord uses to teach in regard to these times and say. So, for Irenaeus, the elders are certainly the the generation after the apostles, including Papias. Now, this is interesting, because if Papias is an elder, and Polycarp is an elder, in Irenaeus's mind, and John is not, then who is Papias referring to as elders? According to Irenaeus, Papias heard from John the apostle, it's, it's very clear in Irenaeus. Uh, Richard Bauckham tries to make a case that uh, Irenaeus is referring to this other John. I think his case is pretty lame. It's, it's clear, I think, in Irenaeus, if you read it, that he's constantly referring to uh, the disciple of the Lord and the evangelist. Um, According to Irenaeus, Papias heard from John just like Polycarp, and these things are borne witness to in writing by Papias, the hearer of John and the companion of Polycarp. And for Irenaeus, John is the apostle. It, if you look at chapter 2, um, or book 2, chapter 22, uh, two verse 5, you can see the, that he makes the connection clearly. So I think what is going on here is that Irenaeus and Papias both talk about the generation coming before them from whom they received the tradition. Those are the elders. The elders are the previous generation who preserved and passed on the tradition to them. But it was a different generation for Irenaeus and Papias. For Irenaeus, the previous generation, was like people like Papias and Polycarp. They were the others for Irenaeus. But for Papias, the previous generation were John and the other apostles. They were the others for him. I think this is what is going on um, here. We have to mention that Eusebius had a bias. Uh, he, for example, did not question the fact that Polycarp had contact with the apostle John but he questioned that Papias did. He called Papias a man of exceedingly small intelligence, <laughs> smikros onto nun. <laughs> and he disliked Papias <clears throat> um, because of his chiliastic views. Um, William Schrodel says, Eusebius' skepticism was no doubt prompted by his distaste for Papias' chiliasm. So we know that Eusebius had a bias. He wanted to distance Papias from the apostles because he didn't like the views of Papias and he did not want uh, Papias to have 
bigger authority uh, than, uh, or such a big authority that would uh, substantiate his Gileastic views. So <clears throat> let's now go back and look at those passages that Eusebius interprets, interprets and see what we can make of them. So we have seen this. I read it again. He says, Papia says, but I shall not hesitate also to put down for you, along with my interpretations, whatsoever things I have at any time learned carefully from the elders, paraton presbyteron, from the elders, and carefully remembered, guaranteeing their truth. For I did not, like the multitude, take pleasure in those that speak much, but in those that teach the truth, not in those that relate strange commandments, but in those that deliver the commandments given by the Lord to faith and springing from the truth itself. If then anyone came who had been a follower of the elders, look at the words because we will come back to them, the Greek words. Tistois presbyterois eltoi. I questioned him in regard to the words of the elders, tuston presbyteron, anekrinon logus, what T, Andrew, or what Peter said, Apen, or what was said by Philip, or by Thomas, or by James, or by John, or by Matthew, or by any other of the disciples of the Lord, and what things Aristion and the presbyter John, who presbyteros Ioannes. The disciples of the Lord say, Legusin. For I did not think that what was to be gotten from the books would profit me as much as what came from the living and abiding voice. There are three distinctions that we see in, uh, in Papias' uh, paragraph. The first distinction is those that speak much and those that teach the truth. Papias wanted to know the truth, not hear much. That's, that's the first distinction. He wanted to inquire from those who teach the truth. The second distinction that he makes is the elders, presbyteroi, and the disciples of the Lord. Now, this is a, um, a typical uh, insect bug distinction. So every bug is an insect, but not every insect is a bug. Every elder is a disciple. It's the, the, the disciple is the larger category for Papias. But not ed, every disciple is an elder. So, and we know this from the New Testament, that uh, if elders refers to apostles, as I would argue is the case, we, we see this in the New Testament. There were disciples who were not apostles. So this is the second distinction. And the third distinction is past tense and present tense. So he uses the word eipen when he lists Peter, Matthew, Thomas, Andrew, who we know were the 12. Eipen. And he uses present tense, legusin, when he refers to Aristion and John. Now why... Why could that be the case? Because probably they were still alive when Papias uh, inquired. So um, John and Aristion are mentioned separately. John is listed twice. So when he says Andrew, Matthew, Peter, Thomas, John, he's there. He's there among the 12. And then he repeats, uh, uh, sorry, he has two names again, Aristion and John ho presbyteros. I think this is what is going on here. So the disciples is the larger category. Elders and apostles are the smaller category. So the elders who are, I think, the apostles, Andrew, Peter, James, John, Matthew, Thomas. So Aristion is only a disciple. Aristion is a disciple of the Lord. He is also a trustworthy witness because he heard Jesus speak. But the elders are especially trustworthy. And then he, makes, he lists John again with Aristion because he was not dead. I think that's the reason he 
mentions John again with Aristion. So Matthew, Peter, Thomas, Andrew are dead. John and Aristion, Legusin, they are still alive. Why does he call John the elder? According to the Eusebian paradigm, he, uses, he calls him who presbyteros, who presbyteros, Ioannes, to distinguish him from the Apostle John. He's not the Apostle John, but the Elder John. And this is how it is used all the time in New Testament studies. But I think the real reason is much more simple. I think, and it's the opposite. I think he calls him John the Elder because Aristion wasn't an elder, but John was. So I think the real reason is that Aristion wasn't an elder, but John was. So that's the, that's the real reason why he mentioned. So he, he says, and, and Aristion and John, Legusin. Which John? So the elder John. Aristion is a disciple, but John is also an elder. And to signify that this John is not a different John, but that same John which was mentioned among the elders. I think that's the real reason he, use, he adds ho presbyteros. So, linguistically, I think Papias is using here an anaphoric reference. What is an anaphoric reference? An anaphoric reference unit refers to another unit that was introduced earlier on in the text or speech. So, if you, I mean, this is when you read elder presbyter in the English translation. It's very misleading because you, you, you miss the anaphoric reference, but in the Greek it's the same word. I questioned him in regard to the words of the elders, ton presbyteron, and then he lists them, including John. There is John. And then they apen, they, they said it, and then, or by any other of the disciples of the Lord, so they are disciples too, but any other of the disciples of the Lord, and what things Aristion, so he's one of the other disciples, and the other John, Legusin, say it, so they are still alive, but he, he knows that he has mentioned John, so I think he uses an anaphoric reference here, ho presbyteros Ioannis, so th one of those. So I think he, he is sp saying the exact opposite of what is often attributed to him in the Eusebian paradigm. But are the list of names, Andrew, Peter, Matthew, John, really identical with the others? If then anyone came who had been a follower of the elders, I questioned him in regard to the words of the elders, what, T, what? So is he then listing the elders? Let's compare verse 4 and verse 7. In verse 4 he says, If then anyone came who had been a follower of the elders, eide pukai pare kolutekos tis tois presbyterois ethoi. Verse 7. So it's very very shortly follows verse 4, so it's three verses later. And Papias, of whom we are now speaking, confesses that he received the words of the apostles from those that followed them. Ton apostolon logus paraton autois parekolutekoton. But says that he was himself a hero of Aristion and the presbyter John. This is very interesting because um, there is an, uh, an underlining, underlying text that Eusebius tries to interpret. But it seems that he is also confused sometimes, and Bauckham acknowledges this. That um, he, he says here that Papias was inquiring of those who listened to the apostles, and uses the same verb. So it seems that, that Eusebius is really um, 
bringing in an idea that is not in Papias is text. He creates a distinction that does not exist in uh, Papias. He is talking about the others who are the apostles. But if you look at it linguistically, uh, the real question is, what is the T pronoun referred to? I questioned him in regard to the words of the others, what T Andrew or what Peter said. And there are two options, really. The first option is it's an accusative of general reference. So what Andrew, Peter, etc. said, reported by the others. That's, that's one option to go by. So it's, it's a general reference. Um, it's, it's not um, the words of Andrew and Peter, but that reported by the, the others that Peter and Andrew and others said. The other option is it's an accusative of, of apposition or interpretation. What the elders, that is, Andrew, Peter, Matthew, John, and, and the others said. So which one is it? Gundry says the accusative of general reference is the accusative of last resort for exegesis. And uh, Dan Wallace says the same in his uh, Greek grammar. Uh, it should be employed as a last resort, that is, only after other categories have been exhausted. Now, in this case, the accusative of apposition makes the meaning perfectly coherent. I questioned him in regard to the words of the others, that is, what Andrew or what Peter, what Matthew and the others said. Therefore, we don't need the last resort. So I think it's clear that uh, Papias thinks that the others are Peter, Andrew, Matthew, Thomas, and the others. Um, let me add one more argument. Papias goes out of his way to emphasize that he had trustworthy and authentic sources to the truth. That's his point. I wanted to know the truth and not hear from those who said much. If the others were not the apostles, it is strange, it would be strange, that Papias says nothing about how they got their information. It makes more sense that Papias inquired from those who listened to the elders who were Andrew, Peter, Thomas, Matthew, and personally inquired from the still living Apostle John and Aristion, the disciple of the Lord. So, what happens if we refute Eusebius' interpretation of Papias? I think a lot of other references come to the surface, which this paradigm just uh, hides. So this is an iceberg. Uh, we don't have many sources. But I think what we see in uh, those scarce sources show that there, there had to be an underlying um, general idea of perceiving the apostles as elders of the tradition. Let me give you some examples. The first example comes from uh, 1 Peter, 1 Peter 5, in which Peter himself says, so I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder, who sympres buteros, and the witness of the sufferings of Christ. Papias knew First Peter. We know this, and was inspired by him. This is, we know this from Eusebius. So, could it be that this is why Papias called the apostles elders? Maybe. We have Second John and Third John. Both letters start with. Hopres Buteros. Now, who is this Hopres Buteros? Um, I mean, most people, most theologians would say it's the other John. And we can agree, yes, it's the other John. But who is the other John? Papias writes on John and he says, Tut Hopres Buteros, elegant. Marcos. And then he talks about how Peter was, uh, or he was the interpreter of Peter. And he clearly speaks of, uh, of John the Apostle. 
So why, why the singular? This is unusual. In, uh, in almost all of the literature that speaks about elders, it's in the plural. This is very unusual that he uh, uses it in the singular, ho presbyteros. Why singular? Uh, could it be because he was the only living apostle or the only living elder by that time? We have a witness to this. Je Jerome says, for example, that John lived until the time of uh, Trajan, Trajanus. And uh, even in the Gospel of John, we hear about the rumor that John would not die. Uh, and probably the rumor was uh, strengthened by the fact that John was overliving the other apostles. So could it be because he was, the, by that time, the only elder in that sense, in that um, authoritative sense? Now, let's go to Ignatius of Antioch. I exhort you to study to do all things with a divine harmony while your bishop presides in the place of God and your presbyters in the place of the assembly of the apostles. Ton presbyteron es topon synedriu ton apostolon. This is, uh, he writes to the Mag Magnations. Again, uh, in his letter to the Trallians, he says, it is therefore necessary that without the bishop, ye should do nothing, but should also be subject to the presbytery as to the apostle of Jesus Christ. To presbyterio, host tois apostolois, Jesu Christo. So uh, he creates an analogy between uh, the elders of the local church and the apostles of the universal church. The bishop is Jesus Christ. The presbytery is the apostles. He, he had, you know, this threefold uh, distinction between in the leadership of the church, bishop, elders, and deacons. Uh, in, to the Smyrna, Smyrnian church, he says, he writes, See that ye will follow the bishop, even as Jesus Christ does the Father, and the presbytery, as ye would the apostles, to presbyterio hostois apostolois, and reverence the deacons as being the institution of God. Now, is it only an analogy? We have one clue that maybe it's more than an analogy. Uh, to the Philadelphians, he's, he writes, I flee to the gospel as to the flesh of Jesus and to the apostles as to the presbytery of the church. Tois apostolois, hos presbyterio ecclesias. So it seems that it's not just an analogy. He really thinks that in one sense, the elders of the church are the apostles. Now, uh, I found this article uh, as I was uh, researching this, which uh, is the shortest article I have ever seen. This is the, this is the article <laughs> written by uh, G.M. Lee, and uh, he it's 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 very very um, cryptic. He he says um, in the Coptic. Canons of Athanasius, paragraph 87, occurs a passage which uh, W.E. Crum translates thus. He bade the priests that they should forgive men, saying, those whose sins, and here comes a quotation from uh, John 20, 23, which in the original Greek would unquestionably have run Ekeleuse tus presbyterus, or enetailatotois presbyterois. So he thinks the priest, the word priest, and you can see the, the Coptic word in the um, footnotes, uh, was originally presbyteros or presbyteroi. Um, and uh, he concludes his. Uh, his uh, well-researched article. Um, I really like this fact that one, one could write an article in, in a half a page and publish it. If my interpretation is right, we seem to have a further slight testimony that presbyteros could on occasion be applied to an apostle. So 
it can be one little tip of, a, of the iceberg. Then look at Revelation, the book of Revelation, Revelation 4.4. 4. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones were 24 elders, presbyterus, clothed in white garment with golden crowns on their heads. Now, you know there are so many interpretations of, of the book of Revelation and who the 24 elders are. But one of the most plausible interpretations is that it is the 12 tribes and the 12 apostles. And what might give a clue to this is chapter 21, uh, 12 to 14, where in the New Jerusalem, we see the 24 uh, tribes and the 24, sorry, the 12 tribes and the 12 apostles, the 12 apostles being the foundation stones of the New Jerusalem. So, um, what is the significance for our access to apostolic witness if this is really the case that the early church viewed the apostles in some sense as the others of the church? Um, if Papias personally, personally knew an apostle and knew people who listened to apostles, then in Papias' time, end of the first century, probably. It's a different time when he wrote and a different time when he inquired. So it's, it's earlier when he inquired than when he wrote. It was possible to have access to first-hand apostolic witness. This goes against all the assumptions of form geschichte, of form criticism. There was a possibility to have access to first-hand apostolic witness, even um, in the, uh, around the close of the apostolic age. If Papias personally knew an apostle and knew people who listened to apostles, then his testimony as to how some of the gospels were written, for example, that Peter was behind Mark, is weighty evidence. So if he, if he did have access to people who listened to the apostles and had access to the apostle John, I'm, I mean, they were pretty sure who wrote the Gospels and how the Gospels were created, then Papias' evidence is weighty evidence. And we, we, should, we should trust him much more than what is the custom. And, and thirdly, his preference of oral testimony over against written testimony is not in fact a contrast between orality and books, but a contrast between first-hand evidence and second-hand evidence. So he's not arguing when he says, I prefer the living and abiding voice over against uh, books. His point is not that orality should be more trusted than written memoirs but that he wanted to know the, have the true sources. He, he was interested in the truth. Papias is a witness to the early Christian belief that the tradition of the apostles was the backbone of normative, normative teaching. He wanted to know the memoirs of Andrew, Peter, Matthew, memories, sorry, of Andrew, Peter, Matthew, John, those who knew the Lord personally. So this is, Papias is a witness that there was an apostolic backbone to tradition in the early church. And that there were living authoritative witnesses in the early church to the words and acts of Jesus. Who were they? The disciples and apostles of the Lord. And also, the early church could make a distinction. Papias is a witness to that, that the early church could make a distinction between speaking much and teaching the truth based on apostolic witness. So they knew the difference between legitimate and illegitimate diversity. Papias is also, and this is what I would like to close with, Papias is also a witness to the fact that the New Testament, for example, the Gospel of Mark or the Gospel of Matthew, was being formed in order to preserve this apostolic witness for the coming generations. 
as the words of the elders of the New Testament church, the words of the witnesses and guardians of the words of the Lord Jesus himself. Thank you, and now we can open up for, for Q&A.